What a uh, powerful reminder of God's great love for us demonstrated at the cross of Christ. Last uh, Friday, we uh, had our Good Friday Reflection, and I hope and pray that as we remembered God's great love for us, that while we were still sinners, He sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross to pay for the sins that we can never repay. It will really move us to hold on to our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter what circumstance uh, we are in, and that we will continue to, to preach uh, the Word of God and proclaim Jesus as the Savior of the world. Uh, today is uh, traditionally uh, called the Easter Sunday. And it's good for us to be reminded about the essence of Easter Sunday. It is a time for us to commemorate and celebrate the resurrection of our Lord uh, Jesus Christ. So I'm not sure if you greeted uh, others uh, Happy Easter. Uh, someone, uh, a number of them greeted me Happy Easter uh, uh, earlier, and I think there's nothing wrong with that as long as we know the essence of, of Easter. But also good to greet each other a Happy Resurrection Sunday that will be more uh, direct. And I would encourage you to just greet the person uh, beside you, Happy Resurrection Sunday. And those worshiping with us online, just type on the comment section, Happy Resurrection Sunday. And we recognize that you're also uh, joining us uh, for worship uh, online. If you have your, your Bibles uh, with you, please uh, open it to, to John uh, chapter 4. We are continuing our series on uh, the Gospel of John, Knowing Jesus. And uh, today, we will be uh, reflecting upon and learning about the implications and significance of Jesus as the Savior of the world. Now, we need to first and foremost uh, be reminded that, that the Lord Jesus Christ had died on uh, on Good Friday, and then he resurrected on Sunday, on the third day. Why is it important for us uh, to know that Jesus Christ has resurrected? The Apostle uh, Paul uh, wrote, And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. Our uh, focus this year is each one, Disciple one. And as we disciple one, we need to have that burden to keep on directing people to Jesus. We need to uh, uh, preach uh, the gospel of Jesus. Uh, wherever the Lord has uh, placed us, that is our mission field. In your workplace, uh, in your businesses, uh, in your community, wherever the Lord has placed you in this season of your life, that is your mission field. But God also gives us opportunities to do mission work uh, outside our community, outside our workplaces. Uh, we go to other places where the Lord is leading us. Uh, just uh, the past week, uh, our sister Patty Narmal, Pastor Jonar, and Elder June went to Balabak in Palawan to visit our missionary there to check up on them and to minister to them. So we have a lot of opportunities that God is opening uh, for us, and as well as for the school community. Remember, we have the school. Uh, the school is our ministry as a church. We have about 430 students. And uh, for the grades 11 and 12, they will be going on a mission trip uh, this coming of May 20 to 24 in Davao. So we will be bringing about uh, 24 students, grades 11 and 12, uh, for one week in, uh, in Davao to minister to a public school within the community. And also, we will bring them in a tribal uh, uh, church uh, about maybe two or three hours from Davao. So for two days, we will have a DVBS in a public school. Uh, many of them are, uh, are Muslims. And then on the third day, we will be bringing them in a tribal church that we visited uh, last year. So they are raising funds for this uh, because the students have a lot of uh, expenses in their education, so they are raising funds uh, for their mission trip. Uh, the cost of the stay in Davao is 8000 for per student, and the flight is almost the same, 8000 So 8 plus 8 16. There are other expenses. It's about 20 uh, per, per student. 
And some of them have siblings, or siblings so that will double for one family. So uh, outside, uh, and every Sunday, they have a table outside. They are selling uh, uh, cookies, uh, pastries as part of their uh, effort to raise funds for their expenses in this upcoming mission trip in, uh, in Davao. So if you have that burden to, to help them, you may want to go there and encourage them and uh, uh, purchase the pastries. Or if you are on diet, uh, just like me, you can just uh, give a support uh, to them. However, the Lord will lead you. And that is one way for us uh, to, to preach uh, the gospel. We go out to the community. So it's very important for us to know that Jesus Christ resurrected. Otherwise, our preaching of the gospel will be in vain. Now, second, the Apostle Paul said, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. It means that if the Lord Jesus Christ has not resurrected, whatever we have been talking about, about who Jesus Christ is and what He has done and what He will be doing, all of these things will be in vain. Why? Because He has not resurrected. So because of what, uh, what uh, the resurrection gives to us, an assurance that our faith is not in vain because the Lord Jesus Christ resurrected, we can go through this life very confident that the Lord Jesus Christ will never leave us and will never forsake us. And whatever we know about Jesus Christ, we can hold on to it. We can put our faith in Him because He has resurrected. And one of the things that uh, we need to focus on uh, today, thinking about Jesus as the Savior of the world, is that He is also the sustainer of the world. In Colossians uh, 1, uh, 1.15, 1.15 to 17, the Apostle Paul said, referring to Jesus Christ, uh, He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Now, because Jesus Christ has resurrected, we can be confident that He is the one who is sustaining us. He is our sustainer. And whatever issues or problems and trials you are having now, the Lord will sustain you all the way until the end. Why? Because He is the sustainer of all, all things. That's why sometimes we do not engage ourselves in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in proclaiming the gospel and preaching Christ. Why? Because we focus so much on uh, what we need at the moment, the problems that we are facing. And when we focus on these problems and forget about who Jesus Christ is, the Savior of the world who has resurrected, we won't be able to take part in what He wants us to do in redeeming this broken world to Himself. So the challenge for us today is that thinking about Jesus as the Savior of the world, we will continue to keep directing people to Jesus all the way until the end. Paul said in verse 18 of Colossians 1, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This is a reminder for us that the Lord Jesus Christ is still in the business of redeeming this broken world to Himself. And what we have heard from the choir, the cross said it all. It means that the Lord Jesus Christ is still in the business of redeeming this broken world to Himself. He's reconciling this world through the blood of Christ shed on the cross. And I hope and pray that today, as we have a clearer understanding on what it means for Jesus to be the Savior of the world, we will just be motivated to exalt Him and to magnify Him in our life. Because the mere fact that we are reminded of the cross of Christ that is a demonstration of God's love for you and for me. 
But even though oftentimes we forget about Him, His love will sustain us all the way until the end. He will sustain us all the way until the end. And in our passage today, in John chapter 4, one of the things that we will learn is that the Lord Jesus Christ saves people who will be worshipers in spirit and in truth. The Lord Jesus Christ has put an end to all temple sacrifices and rituals. The place of worship is no longer an issue. It's more of an issue of the heart. And we need to worship God in spirit and in truth. We don't only worship Him here, but we worship Him every day of, of our life. So in this, uh, in this uh, passage in John chapter 4, uh, we will learn uh, five truths about Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world. And I hope and pray that as we reflect on who Jesus Christ is as the Savior of the world, we will be all the more prompted to honor Him and to worship Him in our life. Just to give a, uh, a quick uh, overview of John uh, chapter 4, our passage will be verses 1 to 42. We will see here that at the beginning, the Lord Jesus Christ learned that the Jewish opposition are really thinking uh, why the disciples of Jesus or Jesus is, are, is baptizing more than the disciples of John. So uh, the controversy between Jesus and the Jewish leaders are starting to brew. But the Lord Jesus Christ knew that it was not yet time for him to confront the Jewish leaders. So what did he do? He is currently, during this time, in this context, he was in Judea, and then uh, he will be going to Galilee. Now, the shortest way from Galilee, from Judea to Galilee, is a, a straight path, but you have to pass through Samaria. And most of the you know, uh, Jewish uh, people would not want to pass through Samaria because there's an animosity between the Samaritans and the Jews. The Jews looked down on the Samaritans. They considered them as uh, half-breeds, that they are impure, that they have nothing to do with them. Otherwise, they will be defiled. So instead of the normal, of the regular Jew passing through Samaria, they will either pass through uh, the coast, uh, coastal way or on the east of the Jordan in Perea, a longer, a longer route. But here, the Lord Jesus Christ intentionally passed through Samaria so that the gospel of Jesus will reach the Gentiles, the Samaritans. And then at the end of this encounter of Jesus with the Samaritan woman and the Samaritans from the town, we will see here in verses 39 to 42 that many Samaritans believe. So if you look at verse 39 to 42, of John 4, it says, Many Samaritans from that town believe in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. So it was the Samaritans who declared that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Now, what does it mean when it says here that Jesus is the Savior of the world? The first thing we need to understand is this. Uh, Jesus came not to save Israel alone. He came to save people from every nation. So Yahweh sent uh, His Son, Jesus, to be the Redeemer of Israel. But Israel rejected the promised Messiah, but eventually the Lord Jesus Christ will return and redeem Israel, those who will believe in Him as Savior and Lord. So Jesus is not only the Savior of Israel, He is also the Savior of every people from every nation, or the Gentiles. And Paul is the apostle to the, to the Gentiles. Now, second, we need to understand when the Samaritans said that Jesus is the Savior of the world, 
We need to understand that Jesus is the only Savior of the world and His death atoned for the sins of the elect. He is the only Savior of the, of the world. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, if we look at that phrase closely, Savior of the world. When you think about the world, you need to understand how that term world was used in the New Testament. That world, that word world has eight meanings, eight uses in the scriptures, especially in the New Testament. So we need to really understand what the world means as used in this phrase, Savior of the world. Now, when we think about Jesus as the Savior of the world, we should not think about Jesus as the Savior of the whole world in a sense that He will save everyone, even those who will not believe in Him. That world, in this context, Savior of the world, is somehow limited to those who will believe in Him. Because one day the Lord Jesus Christ will return. And He will take those who are His and judge those who are not His. So when the Lord Jesus Christ uh, returns, He will take those who believe in Him as Savior and Lord, and those who will not be believing in Jesus will be sent into eternal judgment. So you need to have this understanding about the concept of Jesus as the Savior of the of the world. Now, in this, uh, in this passage, uh, there are five things, as I mentioned, uh, we will learn about Jesus as the Savior of the world. The first one is this. Jesus orchestrates uh, all things so that people will believe in Him. If you look at uh, uh, John uh, 4, verses uh, 1 to 4, it says, now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. Take note of that. He had to pass through Samaria. He had the option to pass through the coastland. He has the option to pass through the east of the Jordan uh, River, but he had to pass through Samaria. Why? Because that is part of God's divine plan in proclaiming the gospel. Not only to Israel, not only to the Jewish people, but also to the non-Jewish people. He had to pass through Samaria. And as we think about this, even as we reflect upon our life, think about those at the time that you believe in the gospel of Jesus. You need to recognize how God orchestrated things so that you will come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. It is not merely your work or your desire that is part of God's redemptive plan. And as we think about that time, we need to remind ourselves how merciful and gracious our God is. That while we were still sinners running away from God, God arranged all things so that we will be moved to put our faith in Jesus. And as we think about that concept, we also need to be confident that whatever happening in our life, whatever is happening in our life, there's no accident in God's kingdom. God has a purpose for it. The challenge for us is to discern 
how God wants us to respond in that particular circumstance. So Jesus orchestrates all things so that people will believe in Him. And if you are here in this worship service, on site or online or even on demand, and you haven't placed your faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross, I pray that today, God will move in your means. If you have been delaying in recognizing your sinfulness, because you and I and all of us are sinners destined to be separated from God, and we all need to believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. If you haven't done that, you've been resisting that, I pray that today God will prompt you. Because if we are not in Christ, we will be forever eternally separated uh, from Him. And this is a divine appointment for all of us because He arranges all things. Now, second, Jesus did not only arrange all circumstances in our life, but Jesus also breaks down all racial, cultural, and gender barriers. In this uh, uh, quite uh, this, uh, long passage in uh, verses 15 to 14, uh, we will see here that uh, Jesus came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, and then he sat by the well of Jacob, and it was about the sixth hour. A sixth hour from 6 a.m., so that is about uh, 12 noon. So as, as Jesus traveled with his disciples from, uh, from uh, Judea, going to Galilee after six hours, and to, by 12 noon, they were already in, in Sychar. And he sat by the, by the well. Town of Samaria. As I mentioned, the Jewish people and the Samaritans, uh, they have animosity. They do not have a very good uh, relationship. Uh, if you will recall, Israel is divided into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Northern kingdom, there are ten tribes. Uh, by 722 BC, the Assyrian Empire uh, conquered them and dispersed them. So Assyrians, Babylonians, and other uh, people uh, from different nations uh, stayed in Samaria. They married the Jews who were left behind, and they influenced the Jews with pagan worship. But eventually, this uh, Jewish people who, were, who became Samaritans, uh, in a sense that they intermarried with the Jewish people, they eventually they aligned themselves and worshipped uh, Yahweh and you know, forsaken the pagan gods. But they worship in Mount Gerizim. So the Samaritans and the Jews, later we will know, worship in Jerusalem. That's also a point of contention, uh, contention for them. But here we need to see that the Lord Jesus Christ broke down the barrier between the Jewish race and the Samaritan race. Not only that, but even uh, uh, cultural and gender barriers. In verse 7, while Jesus Christ was sitting by the well, a woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? Uh, during that time, uh, men are not allowed to talk to women in public, even their own wives. That's taboo. Because women during that time have no right in, in society. So, a man talking to a Jew is already off. Now, Jesus being a Jew, talking to a Samaritan woman is also some sort that is a taboo. So the woman was wondering why Jesus would talk to her. Now, in verse 10, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. So the, the woman was thinking about physical water that will quench uh, her thirst. So the woman said to Jesus, Sir, if you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep, where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. So the woman was wondering, how in the world can Jesus give her a drink? She doesn't have anything 
to draw water from the well, and the well was, was deep. Now, look at what Jesus said. He said, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So Jesus was not talking about the physical water, but about the living water that represents eternal life, that is available to the woman as offered by, by Jesus. So in this conversation with the, with the Samaritan woman, we need to see that the love of God transcends race, culture, and gender. And this is also a, a good reminder for us that we need to show and share the love in the gospel of Jesus to anyone and to everyone that God is bringing in our means. In the same way, this is a good reminder for us as a church family that we really need to break down the walls of this church. Wherein when people come, especially the pre-believers, they will experience the love and the grace of Jesus. We need to be aware that God is in the business of redeeming this broken world to himself. And there are so many broken people in this world, those who still need the Lord Jesus Christ. And can you imagine if every one of us will be so conscious to be a tangible expression of his love, of God's love to others, people will be drawn to this church. Not because of us, but because they experience the presence and the love of Jesus. In the same way, as, uh, as believers, we know that we all have struggles in life. In the same way, we don't only show the love of Jesus to pre-believers, but we also show love to each other. We need to accept each other. We need to love each other unconditionally with the love of Christ. No matter who they are, no matter what economic status they are in, no matter how different they are from us, we need to show the love of Jesus to them. Because we are also recipients of the love and the grace of Jesus. So when we think about the cross of Christ, let's think about how God redeemed us from sin, how God redeemed us from darkness, and how many people around us, how many people in our life need the Lord Jesus Christ. How many people in our life need to experience the love of God? And if we will have that conviction, I believe that God will give us the privilege to be an instrument of salvation of those who need the Lord Jesus Christ. God's love breaks down all the barriers between races, culture, and gender. The Lord Jesus Christ also knows our every situation. And that is the good news about, about God. He knows the beginning. He knows the end. He knows everything that is happening in our life. Uh, there's nothing that happens in our life that escapes the sight of God. And God uses circumstances in our life for us to be drawn to Him. In verse uh, 15, the woman said to Jesus, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have come here to draw water. And then Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. So when the woman was still thinking about the physical water that she can drink, the Lord Jesus recognized that she really didn't understand what he is offering, that he's offering a well of spring that leads to eternal life. And when God 
when the Lord Jesus Christ addressed this issue of the woman, it shows us that He uses circumstances in our life to transform our hearts. When the Lord Jesus Christ uh, revealed to the woman her situation, that He knew her situation, the woman was transformed and recognized that indeed, the Lord Jesus Christ was a prophet. In verse 18, Jesus Christ said, For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worship on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. So the Lord Jesus Christ met where the Samaritan woman was. The Samaritan woman was maybe thinking that the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't know her situation. But when the Lord Jesus Christ revealed to her that I know your exact situation, she realized that indeed the Lord Jesus Christ is a prophet. And I think oftentimes the Lord uses our circumstances to speak to us. So we should not miss the lessons that the Lord Jesus Christ is teaching us, especially when He allows us to go through trials in life. There are a lot of lessons in the difficult experiences that we have in life, and we need to be confident that God will be using these circumstances to mold us, to transform us, to mature us, to grow us, to strengthen our faith in Jesus, and to glorify God. So when you are in this, if you are in this situation right now, I want to encourage you that Jesus, the Savior of the world, is the sustainer of all things. He will sustain you all the way until the end. He knows exactly what you are going through. And He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And He will see you all the way until the end. You just need to hold on to the reality that Jesus knows everything that is happening in your life. Now, as uh, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, revealed this uh, thought to the woman, we will now go to this section where the Lord Jesus Christ uh, taught the woman, or even us today, that He saves people who will be worshippers in spirit and truth. So the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't only or orchestrate our circumstances. He doesn't only break the barriers between races, gender, and culture. He also doesn't only use his circumstances to transform our hearts, but he also saves people who will be worshipers in spirit and in truth. In verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. And then Jesus said, But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is His Spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that, that every Sunday, we come here anticipating the privilege of worshiping God. And service starts at 10.30. If you enter here 10.30, that's late. You come here before 10.30, you settle down. Prepare your hearts to worship. I think that is a way to honor God. I have preached on this 
couple of years ago, I think, when I preached about this, the following Sunday, ang aga nyo lahat. <laughs> but after that, balik na naman sa usual routine. It will not change unless we change our perspective about who God is. And it is not really honoring to God if we come here late. If we do not worship Him in spirit and in truth. So my prayer is that all of us will have the right perspective about worship. Because God saved us. Not only to enjoy eternal life, not only to be an instrument of salvation to others, but also to be worshipers in spirit and in truth. Now, as we are reminded of our focus this year to each one, disciple one, I want to encourage you to take part in the Great Commission. Wherever you are, whatever season of life you are in, may we all have that burden to share the gospel to people, not only within our church community, not only within your workplace, but when we have opportunities to go on a mission trip, if you haven't experienced that, it will be a good experience uh, for you. Because when we are so conscious in showing and sharing the love and the gospel of Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, reveals that there is a reward in taking part in His work. So as we continue the, uh, the story in John uh, chapter 4, we will see that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, reveals that there's a reward when we take part in His work. So when the disciples uh, came back, remember they left Jesus at the well, they went to the city to buy food, and then they saw Jesus uh, talking to the woman, and they're wondering why in the world is He talking to the woman. And then... Uh, when the disciples uh, came, the woman left the water jar and went away to the town and said to the people there, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? So, as the Lord Jesus was in the well, the disciples were there. The women, the woman went to the seat to the town. And then when they heard the testimony of the woman, they are moving now towards the well where Jesus was. Now, when the disciples were urging Jesus to eat, they said, Rabbi, eat. But the Lord Jesus Christ said, I have food to eat that you do not know. So the disciples were wondering, did someone brought food for him? And Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. So what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, his food is doing the will of the, of the Father. That is the one that will sustain him. Now, when the, uh, when the Samaritans were approaching the Lord Jesus Christ, He told the disciples that, Do you not say there are yet four months? Then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. So what He's saying is this. You don't need to wait for four months to reap the harvest because it's harvest time now. As the Samaritans were approaching them, the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, this is the harvest. Someone already sowed the seed of the gospel and you are going to reap the harvest. In this passage, the Lord Jesus Christ gave the, the image of the uh, farmer sowing seed. And normally, it's the farmer who sowed the seed who will be the one to reap the, the harvest. But Jesus is saying that sometimes when we sow the seed of the gospel, we will not see the harvest, we will not reap the harvest, other people will reap the harvest. In the spiritual realm, that is the case. So for us, we just need to keep on showing and sharing the love and the gospel of Jesus. We trust that God will be the one to transform their hearts. Praise God if that person in our presence receive the gospel of Jesus and we are with that person, discipling that person and really be affirmed that that person believe in the gospel of Jesus. Praise the Lord for that. There is joy. There is satisfaction in that. But what he's saying is this. It's not always the case. There are times that you just 
sow the seed of the gospel, and others will reap it. And that's okay. It should not deter us from sowing the seeds of the gospel. So let's keep on directing people to, to Jesus. Let's keep on directing people to Jesus. There's a reward, that joy of being able to uh, lead people to Christ. But even though we will not be able to uh, reap the harvest in the sense that we'll be able to know that the person that we share the gospel with received the gospel, it's still okay. We just focus on the cross of Christ. Because every time that you remember the cross of Christ, you need to remember the love of God that we need to share to others. So in these spiritual truths about Jesus as the Savior of the world, my prayer is that we will continue to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. When I was in, uh, in college, I was a full-blooded Roman Catholic. I grew up in a Roman Catholic family, very strict tradition. And when I was in college in UST, in my first year until uh, fourth year, we were arranged alphabetically. So my surname is Viloria. The, uh, the girl beside me, Iturzaita. Why? So I do not know why in the world we were together for four years as seatmates. But oftentimes, she will leave a pamphlet on my desk. And I do not want to open the pamphlet. I do not want to even touch it. But she will not say anything. She will just leave pamphlets in my desk. And then, I also had a handful of uh, friends in college. A couple of them will invite me to a fellowship. Every time that I will hear the word fellowship, I got scared, I got threatened, and I do not want to join them. So I resisted these things. But after graduation, maybe after two years of working in Filipina Shell, uh, my wife, uh, Linda, uh, invited me to attend the GCF in uh, San Juan in Medicor building. And you know the story, you know, that's the first time I met Linda face to face. That's also the first time, that's also the time that I came to a saving knowledge of Jesus when Elder June Espirito shared the gospel to me. So as I was reflecting on my life, I really believe in the gospel of Jesus. March 11, 1990. In that brief moment that Elder June shared the gospel with me, I really felt the presence of God in my life. And sometimes I wonder, is that really true? For 15 minutes, the Lord just spoke to me and gave me the courage to believe in Jesus. Yeah, God can do that. God can do that to any one of us. But looking back, I believe that my seatmate in college, Jenny Itorsaita, has been sowing the seeds of the gospel in my heart. It only bore fruit six years after. She sowed the seed, another reap the harvest. So let's continue to direct people to Christ, whether we see the results or not. We have been saved by grace. We have received the love of Jesus. So let's continue to save, to share the gospel of Jesus. As the Savior of the world, we need to proclaim that reality. And when we do that, we are honoring and magnifying the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we end our time together, let's just magnify the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
knowing that we have been saved through faith. And if you are not yet a believer, if you have not believed in the gospel of Jesus, I hope and pray that as you have been worshiping with us and listening to this message, that God is speaking to your heart. May God bring you to a point of hopelessness and helplessness and recognize that you are a sinner just like me. And there's nothing we can do on this earth to earn that right to be in the presence of God. We need to repent of our sin, we need to confess of our sin, and we need to believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for the sins that we can never repay. I cannot do this for you, but I hope and pray that God will prompt you to do this. And when you do this, when you acknowledge that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you will receive eternal life. And you will be so confident that no matter what you're going through in life, the Lord will sustain you all the way until the end. Father God, we want to uh, thank you for the privilege of worship. We want to thank you, Father, for reminding us about Jesus as the Savior of the world. We thank you also for reminding us about your love for us demonstrated at the cross of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for we know that while we were still sinners, you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross to pay for the sins that we can never repay. Thank you for reminding us that indeed he is the sustainer of all things. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us that you save us, not only for us to enjoy eternity with you, not only for us to uh, be an instrument of salvation for others, but also for us to be worshipers in spirit and in truth. And that is, Lord, what we want to do at this moment, to just bring back all the honor and the glory to you. We just want to bless the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 